Good afternoon, and welcome to Granny Annie Family Story Celebration's annual event, the Family Stories Festival. I'm so happy you're here with us today to support these young people. My name is Connie McIntyre. I'm a founding uh, director of the Granny Annie, and uh, the Granny Annie, for those of you who don't know, is uh, headquartered right here in St. Louis, Missouri. It's a nonprofit organization. And on behalf of the board and all our dedicated volunteers, for whom we are very thankful, we want to thank you all for coming here today. This is going to be a really fun afternoon, so I hope you sit back and relax and enjoy yourself and, and pitch in when you have the opportunity, which is coming up in about an hour, so I'll tell you more about that later. But for those of you, who, of you who are not that familiar with the Granny Emmy, let me just say that each year we invite young people everywhere to interview someone in their family and uh, learn something interesting, interesting to them about their family history, and then to capture that story in their very best writing. We encourage the students to illustrate their story if they want to, and definitely to share their story, to share their story with their extended family, and with their school and community, and with the Granny Annie. During this past school year, 555 young people shared their stories with the Granny Annie. And those are the names, uh, author names, and uh, story titles that you saw on the screen uh, just a few moments ago. And we'll be sharing those with you again throughout the afternoon, so you can keep an eye out for those, and they're just full of inspiration. So enjoy those, please. Um, we actually had over 100 young people take part in the Granny Annie this year, some writing stories and some illustrating stories. We also solicit illustrations from students in the same age group. So sometimes the person who illustrated the story is not the person who, who wrote the story. Um, and we, this year I think we had 91 illustrations submitted and 12 of those were published. As I said, we had 555 stories submitted and 36 of those were published. So it's a significant honor. You are in the presence, presence of some very talented young people today, and I know you're going to enjoy hearing what they have to say. We have a triple treat today. Today is going to be so fun. We're going to, of course, be hearing from the students who were published this year in our annual volume, which this year is Granny Annie Volume 11. And we're also going to be hearing from students who are published in the Granny Annie's 10th anniversary volume, which is called Echoes from World War II. So keep an eye out for that book. You'll see it scattered around um, the rooms uh, in the hallway and beyond. And also, Echoes from World War II is available upstairs in the gift shop. If you would like to purchase it, it's, it's published in paperback as well. So you can pu uh, purchase a copy or, or more than one and have them signed by the authors and artists who are here, which is a real fun thing to do. And not only that, actually, uh, you may have noted, tomorrow is D-Day, uh, the anniversary of D-Day. So if you have any veterans uh, or families of veterans that, that you think you might be interested, I can guarantee you uh, there is so much in that book to connect with. The stories uh, in the uh, World War II book are, were all originally published in our first 10 <coughs> volumes of Granny Annie. And uh, they're just an amazing collection, not only from the battlefield, but also from homes all around the world and what people's experiences were during the time period of, of World War II. I think the, the first story starts with Kristallnacht, the, the Night of Broken Glass, and it proceeds through the entire war and ends actually with the Japanese surrender. So you can get a very, uh, probably the most unique uh, story you, or, or um, reading you've ever done of uh, World War II and just how that how that really affected people uh, on a on a one on one level, personal level. So um, let's see. Is there anything else I need to say, or can we just move on? Are we ready to move on? Let's get this show going, and I'm going to turn this podium over to Fran Hamilton. Fran is also co-founder and a current associate director of the Granny Annie. And Fran is that volunteer who, if she didn't show up, the rest of us would just have to pack our bags and leave because she contributes so much to the experience that you and your family had uh, researching your story and, and just all the way through the Granny Annie experience. 
So we're uh, very happy to have with us Fran Hamilton. Well, if it weren't for Connie McIntyre, uh, you wouldn't be here either because uh, this was her original brainchild. Before we hear from the authors and artists today, uh, I'd like to introduce some other very special people who have made today's Family Stories Festival possible. I'd like you to please stand as you or a group that you're part of is mentioned. And some of you will be standing more than once, so just get ready. First, student authors. Uh, this would be anyone who in the past 11 years has written a Granny Annie story, whether or not it was published, whether or not you even submitted it to the Granny Annie. Now, some of you should definitely be standing up. Come on, stand up. Let's have some applause for the authors. Now, student artists, anyone who in the past 11 years has drawn an illustration for a Granny Annie story, whether or not it was published and whether or not you even submitted it. I know there are some artists here as well, at least two. <laughs> we'll be hearing from them later, the authors and artists both, those who were published. Now, parents and other family members of anyone in the previous two groups, um, sharing your family stories with younger generations is such an invaluable gift. It gives young people a stronger sense of their own identity. It gives them roots. And your encouragement and support are vital throughout the process of writing and revising a story or creating an illustration. Okay, parents, stand up and take your applause. Come on, parents, family members, grandparents, everybody be like to like any author or artist. Now, teachers or principals of any Granny Annie author or artist, teachers also provide important guidance and encouragement throughout the creative process, and often it's a teacher who makes families aware of the Granny Annie to begin with. So if you're an educator that has worked with Granny Annie young people, please stand up. We're so happy to have you here, and Later in the family story circle portion of the day, which you'll be, Connie will be telling you more about, but there's a special group for educators and for parents who want to find out how to extend the Granny Annie experience. So please be sure to stay for that after this program. Okay, Granny Annie board members. That's a smaller group, so there won't be as many standing. Connie and I are on the board, and Brad and Jessica. Is Jessica, are you here? I'm not seeing her, but we're glad to have Brad here. <laughs> oh, Linda, yes, where's Linda? I'm sorry, Linda. <laughs> now, Granny Annie volunteers. This is a big group. For the first few years, the Granny Annie was completely volunteer, and many tasks are still performed by volunteers. Without volunteers, the Granny Annie simply would not exist. So if you've ever done anything to volunteer for the Granny Annie, please stand up. Don't make me look like a liar here. The Granny Annie thanks the Missouri History Museum for making the space available to us, for providing technical assistance, and for helping us to promote this event and make the community aware of, of it. Now, before I introduce a couple of individuals, I want to remind you to please turn off your cell phones so that students' presentations and our recording of the program will not be interrupted. 
Now this afternoon, Gwen Ashley will be introducing the artist. Gwen, would you stand up please? So she's in the back right now, but we'll get her down front later. Gwen uh, will be introducing the artists and talking about their illustrations. Gwen is now retired from 18 years of teaching art in the St. Louis Public Schools and teaching interior space design at Washington University. In addition, she is an artist and designer in her own right. And Martha Stegmeier will again this year be serving as our MC for today's program. She has been a Granny Annie enthusiast from the beginning and she serves as a member of the Granny Annie Selection Committee. We have about 25 to 30 people who help us read the stories each year and select what will be published. Uh, Martha has also served as a read aloud coach and before her retirement, Martha was the director of the St. Louis Public School Partnership for the Educational Nonprofit Springboard, which is the area's largest provider of in-school arts and enrichment programs. And now I'm going to turn things over to Martha to get us into the heart of our program. Hello, everybody. Um, just one little tip. So you all have a program, right? Those yellow programs? So um, as you're listening to the stories and enjoying the illustrations, you might want to make a little note because you're going to have a chance to talk to the artists and um, the authors afterwards. They'll be in story circles. It could be, where did you get the story? Um, is your grandpa here? Um, how did you get this story? Things like that. Tips for next year, because we hope to see many of you back next year. So, as they say, without further ado, let's, let's get to the authors. Our first author is Fiona Hayray. And Fiona was in the fifth grade at the fifth grade center of Ladue School District in Ladue, Missouri, when she wrote her story, No Shoes, No Guardian, and No Protection. No shoes, no guardian, and no protection. 1893, near Waterville, Pennsylvania, USA. Two girls walk along a dirt path in the Pocono Mountains. They had no shoes, no guardian, and no protection. The older one, Nina, my great-great-grandma, was nine, and her sister Dorothy was six. Nina had long brown hair, which she always tied up into a neat ponytail. Dorothy's hair was the same but she let it hang loose. The two sisters were heading home. Home for them was a tent, after gathering berries for lunch. This was usual for them. They lived on the side of a mountain range in Pennsylvania. They grew all of their own food and pumped all of their own water. It was a clear day, the sun was shining, with a slight breeze on the treetops. The dirt road was as dusty as ever, a perfect day for gathering berries. Do you think this will be enough berries for mother? Dorothy asked, looking up at her big sister. She knew the answer. Anything they could gather was enough. I think we'll be fine, Nina said in her sweet, calming voice. Mother will be delighted. Dorothy let out a small sigh of relief, though she didn't need it. Five minutes and they would be home and ready to have these delicious blueberries for lunch. The girls walked along in silence for a while, unaware of what, we got, of what was coming up to give their young hearts a jerk. Dor Nina and Dorothy turned the corner on the mountain range trail, and there they saw, staring at them, was a great, big, black panther, only feet away. His big, green, unblinking eyes were fixed upon them, as if ready to pounce at any moment. Nina felt Dorothy give a small jump, but not enough to alert the panther. Nina thought, stay calm, as if trying to send a message to her little sister. Dorothy appeared to receive it, or it was just common sense. Then, Nina remembered something that she had learned a while ago. If you sing to an animal, it won't attack you. So, doing the only thing she could think of, she grabbed her sister's hand and began to sing a hymn. They skirted around the huge panther, knowing at any moment it could pounce. 
Nana's hands sweated with every step she took. When they finally got around the panther, after what felt like forever, they let out their breath. They looked at each other, then took off at a run. They would have an exciting story to tell their waiting mother when they got home. Um, the main character in my story is Nina, who is my great-great-grandma, and um, this is a story written about, um, well, a biography written about her, because she grew up um, to be one of the first female doctors in the USA. So that's one of the reasons why I chose to write about her. And this is her book. It's called Dr. Nina and the Panther. Wow. So didn't Fiona set us up well, you know, perfect day for strawberry picking, just things as usual when all of a sudden she gave our hearts a jerk, didn't she? With the panther and the singing and the skirting. You are a master of suspense, Fiona. Great job. So our next author is Kristen Neinheis, and Kristen was in the seventh grade at Westminster Christian Academy in Town and Country, Missouri, when she wrote her story, Henrik. Henrik, circa 1940, Oslo, Norway. Service before self. This phrase means a lot. My great-granduncle named Henrik Palmstrom definitely lived by this saying. It was the spring of 1940 in the snowy country of Norway when the Nazis were invaded. Many Norwegians made the decision to flee to safer countries, like England. Henrik, however, made the risky choice to stay. He was working at the University of Oslo, and life would be dangerous for him. Henrik was living in Oslo when Norway was invaded. His vacation home, however, was a cabin in the wooded countryside. Henrik was against the Nazis, and he had been sending radio transmissions to the resistance ever since the war had started. Henrik's house was in a city, so the safest place for him to send these transmissions was from his cabin. Because of this, he ended up spending a lot of time there. Unfortunately, his cabin wasn't always going to be so safe. As winter was approaching, someone from Henrik's work somehow found out what Henrik was doing. Like Henrik, this person had stayed, but for a much different purpose. Henrik stayed to fight the Nazis, however, this person stayed to help the Nazis. This person tattled on Henrik, and the Nazis planned to find him. Thankfully, someone else discovered that the Nazis were going to go after Henrik and warned him. After work that day, Henrik raced over the country roads to his cabin. When he got there, he was trembling with fear and excitement. What was he going to do? Henrik made up his mind. He packed his satchel and placed some important belongings, along with food, in the bag. He reached for his skis, put them on, and escaped out the back door. As the Nazis approached the cabin, Henrik was already on his journey, skiing under the snow-covered trees of the woods. He managed to silently disappear without getting captured by the Nazis. Henrik kept skiing for a while. The snow glistened in the sunlight as his breath formed icy clouds floating in the air. He kept skiing east until he ended up at the Swedish border. He stayed in Sweden for a little while and then was able to take a boat to England. In England, he worked for the Norwegian government in exile. He remained in the refuge of England for the rest of the war. He married an English girl but was able to return to his home in Norway once the war ended. My great-granduncle Henrik was extremely selfless. When the Nazis invaded and everyone fled, Henrik decided to stay. He thought he could do much more to help the Allies by staying than by simply running away. Instead of avoiding the problem, he met it face to face. Henrik was not concerned with the safety of himself, but rather with the well-being of others. He might not have done something heroic, but because of his selflessness, I think Henrik should be someone we look up to. Thank you, Kristen, for telling us this story of your courageous relative. May we face our problems face to face as, as he did. And how neat that um, you have you know, honored his memory by sharing this story with us. So our next author is Paige Hunt. And Paige was in the sixth grade at Immaculate Conception Catholic School in Darden Prairie, Missouri, when she wrote her story, Watching Over Pearl Harbor.
Launching Loader Pearl Harbor, December 7, 1941, Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. My great-grandpa could have died if he had not gone to church. While in the United States Navy, great-grandpa Frank and his brother were deployed to beautiful Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. They slept on the USS Schley, a World War I destroyer ship. Little did they know that a few hours later, an attack from Japan would almost cost them their lives. Frank woke up on Sunday, December 7, 1941, wanting to, to go to church. He walked next door to his brother's cabin and told them to get up because they were going to Mass. Bob, his brother, just continued to sleep because he had stayed up late the night before. Frank again tried to rouse his sleeping brother, but to no avail. Frank then ripped off the sheets, threw open the curtains, and finally Bob awoke. Bob did not want to go to church, but gave up arguing and followed Frank out the door. Frank led the way as they leisurely strolled up to church on a cloudless sunny day. The church building stood on a hill, and from there you could see the expanse of Pearl Harbor. As the mass ceremony began, sirens started blaring. They were under attack. Frank and Bob rushed outside where a sickening sight met their eyes. What they saw would change the course of history. Japanese planes rained down bombs on the ships moored in Pearl Harbor. As terrified as they were, Frank and Bob knew they had to help. Frank tore down the hill with Bob on his heels. They raced across the shore trying to get to the USS Schley, but the wreckage in the water made it impossible to board the ship. A feeling of helplessness washed over Frank. Just as he was about to give up hope, Frank spotted a small sailing boat docked a couple yards away. Frank and Bob clambered in and discovered the boat was full of firefighting equipment. They pushed off into the harbor. While, Frank, or while Bob drenched blazing fires on shore, Frank pulled drowning people out of the water. Frank and Bob saved dozens of lives that day. If they had not gone to church that day, Bob and Frank could have died in the bombing. Frank believed God called him to church so he wouldn't die and so he could save other people. My great-grandpa Frank said that if you put your faith in God, he will keep you safe, and that's exactly what God did. So didn't Paige do a great job transporting us um, to that setting, to that time and place, through the minute details that she shared of that historic day? Thank you, Paige. And our next author is Grace Andrews. And Grace was in the seventh grade at Westminster Christian Academy in Town and Country, Missouri, when she wrote her story, One Little Girl, One Night's Journey. Grace. One Little Girl, One Night's Journey, 1942, Surrey, Virginia. Do you think she'll be okay? Asked her mother worriedly. I mean, she's just five. My sissy, oh, she'll have a great time with great-grandmother, expressed her father confidently. The little girl, who was five years old, was a very curious country girl who would finally spend the night at her grandmother's. As she cooked her favorite meal on the wood stove, she dreamed about how her grandmother's rooms would look. The little girl walked up to the wood stove and peered in at the bubbling water. The bubbling water reminds her of the excitement bubbling inside her. I'm going to grandmother's tonight, she reminded herself while stirring the pot. The smell wafted into the cozy den, and her mother wandered in, saying, The chicken smells wonderful. Are you excited to go to grandmother's? Oh, yes. Jackie went to her grandmother's house, and she said it was amazing, exclaimed the little girl. How about if you check if you're all packed up? The little girl dashed to her room, her heart beating in her chest. She checked. Yep, all packed up. She picked up her tomcat from the windowsill and gave him a hug and a kiss goodbye. Once she was done eating her favorite meal, she skipped to the door. Then she squeezed on her chucks, fastened her shoelaces in a double knot, and started her trip to her grandmother's. When the little girl arrived at her grandmother's, she could smell the fragrances from inside. The little girl knocked on the door and was greeted by the aroma of tea. Her grandmother <coughs> took the hot kettle off the burner. After they had gotten settled, they started their tea. Grandmother said, looks like there's going to be some frost in the morning. The little girl could see the frost creeping like fingers up the window. They had chatted about many things and were ready to go to bed. 
They snuggled down under the loads of covers, and Grandmother fell asleep. But the little girl was still wide awake and unwinding from all the excitement. She felt sad suddenly, but had no idea why. She thought back to the beginning of the day when her dad had let her sleep in and skip her chores because today she was going to grandmother's. Oh, Daddy, how I miss you. I wish you were here with me to comfort me, she sighed. The little girl leaned over, kissed her grandmother on the cheek, and then crawled out of bed. She grabbed her bag and started to walk out the door. She traveled down the hall to her parents' room and told them she was staying in her own bed. As she tiptoed past her grandmother's room to hers, her heart warmed. She was finally home. You can get homesick anywhere. My grandmother Carol learned that the hard way. Carol still laughs about the moment when she traveled 10 steps from her great-grandmother's door back to her own warm, cozy bed. How about that for a surprise ending? Were you as surprised as I to learn that the girl's grandma lived down the hall? Okay. In the same house? It's great. Great job, Grace. Uh, next author is a return. A returning Natalie Rose. And I didn't remember how to pronounce your last name. Schubert. Natalie Rose Schubert. And Natalie um, was at uh, Merrimack Elementary School in the Clayton School District. Clayton, Missouri in 2013 when she wrote this story that is now part of um, the World War II book and her, the name of her uh, story is Sugar, Stamps, Bikes, and Metal. Natalie? Seawalk. If I had written a diary, this is how it might have read. July 1st, 1942. Today my friends and I collected metal. We knocked on doors at the houses in our neighborhood and asked for anything metal. Chicken wire, tin cans, or aluminum foil from gum, gum wrappers, which we saved in balls till they were large enough to be collected. Then a truck drove by. We put all the metal in the truck. The truck driver takes the metal to a collection site from where it is used to build tanks, ships, planes, and bombs for the war that's going on. My friends and I plan to do this every day till the war stops. July 2nd, 1942. What's really a problem is that most of the metal for our country has, is being used for weapons, not for cars. So my parents can't buy a car, even though they want to. Also, we are only allowed to buy a certain amount of food because the government is sending most food to the soldiers. We have to use food stamps to buy meat, tea, cheese, and sugar. Once our food stamps are gone, we can't buy that kind of food anymore. I am craving a big, meaty, delicious steak. Ugh. July 3rd, 1942. Today, my mom sent me to the store with this sugar stamp to buy sugar. I couldn't wait to taste my mom's brownies. I was on the way skipping when the stamp fell down the concrete sidewalk. I didn't notice that I had dropped the stamp, so I kept on skipping to the store to get sugar. I went down the aisle, pulled the sugar down, and happily walked to the checkout lane. The clerk, said, the clerk said, where's your stamp? I reached into my pocket and it wasn't there. I'm sure I had it, I cried. But the clerk said no, so I sadly put back the sugar and walked home. With my head down, I told my mom my story, and I guess that's the end of brownies. July 4th, 1942. Today is the day I'm old enough to ride a bicycle. It's my birthday! But all the metal is being used for weapons, so I thought I wouldn't get one. But then Grandpa Dave found somebody to make a bicycle for me out of used bicycle parts. Grandpa Dave is a little worried that it won't hold up, but I'm not. I love my new orange bicycle, and I'm so excited to get outside and show my friends. That's a week in the ordinary life during World War II. Now I'm a grandfather myself, and I just bought my granddaughter a new bike, and I told her these stories, which she has written here. So this is an example of an author who had a story. Uh, I doubt that her grandpa told her the story in diary form, or that he even had a diary to show her. That's her decision. Isn't that a cool way 
to share that information step by step in one week of a person's life really made it come alive, Natalie, thanks. Our next author is Zachary Fink, and I'm just gonna clue you in on Zachary. Zachary writes like a playwright, or a script writer, to me. Zooming in on five minutes in one family's life during World War II. I know you're gonna enjoy his story, which he wrote in, when he was in the sixth grade at Immaculate Conception Catholic School in Darden Prairie, Missouri. The troubling telegram. And we are troubled that there is no slide for this. Everyone imagine the troubling telegram, okay? And it'll appear. Zachary. <laughs> See? See how powerful you are? <laughs> the troubling telegram, 1942, St. Louis, Missouri. In the year 1942, during World War II, my 13-year-old grandmother was sitting and enjoying breakfast with her family in their formal dining room on Ford Place in St. Louis, Missouri. My great-grandma was a dignified, elegant woman, and great-grandpa was a likable businessman who always had a twinkle in his eye. Grandma dreamed of pancakes with mouth-watering syrup and eggs that were fluffy and light. As she snapped back to reality, her food was served, and she began to eat. With stuffed cheeks, she looked out the window and saw a young man ride up on a bike. Who is that, Mom? asked my grandma, as she and her sister both devoured their food ravenously. <laughs> Great grandma took one look, and the color drained away from her face. I think it's a telegram. Great grandma managed to set her out. Great grandpa looked like he was walking towards his death as he said, Wait here, Amelia. He slowly walked forward, opened the door, and stepped outside. As the young man approached, great-grandma burst into tears and turned away, so no one could see her horrified face. Grandma and her siblings were surprised because their mother never cried. Grandma looked away and stared down at her food, lost in her thoughts. All she could think about was, why? Why are they so upset about something as simple as a telegram? Maybe it means something to them? Then finally, a grim thought struck Grandma. Bill, she thought, realizing that they hadn't heard from her brother fighting in World War II in five weeks. This was a telegram, the way the Army delivered news. It could mean that Bill was either dead or horribly injured. Grandma looked out the window with tears swelling out of her eyes. Just then, Great Grandpa tipped the man and waved goodbye and went back inside with a sad, fearful look on his tired face. And he opened the telegram. Suddenly, great grandpa exploded with laughter, howling like a wolf. My great grandpa looked at him, startled and confused. Great grandpa finally called his outburst of laughter. It, it's not about Bill, honey. It's about my retreat on Sunday. They say not to miss it. Through his laughter, he managed to read, The food is going to be great. <laughs> great grandpa ripped the telegram out of his hands, tore it up, and stomped on it until it was nothing but minuscule minuscule bits of crumpled paper. Later, the family discovered that Great Uncle Bill hadn't been able to write because he had been shot in the hand and he got home safely a couple of months later. Great Grandpa went on his White House retreat and thoroughly enjoyed the fantastic food. Great Grandma and their family never forgot Great Grandma's troubling telegram. Wasn't that amazing? the way he slowed things down and gave you insight into what people were thinking. Thank you, Zachary. Um, our next author is Molly Kuzma, who is also here with one other person, I found out, from the O'Neill School in Southern Pines, North Carolina. And Molly wrote her story in 2015 called Clearing the Way. Molly. Southern Japan. In 1944, my grandfather was an 18-year-old young man from the coal mining regions of Pennsylvania. For the first 17 years of his life, he had never been more than 20 miles away from the town where he was born. After taking his first train ride to the big city of Philadelphia, he was shipped to boot camp in Maryland. Despite having aspirations for being a fighter pilot, 
Given his proficiency in electronics, he was designated to be a radio operator. Instead of fulfilling his dream of being stationed aboard an aircraft carrier or mighty battleship, he was assigned to one of the tiniest ships in the United States Navy, USS YMS 467, a minesweeper whose job it was to clear enemy mines before they could damage the larger ships of the American fleet. Before he knew it, my grandfather was sailing through the Panama Canal towards Hawaii, then Guam. He saw his first combat action off the island of Okinawa. It was there that his ship began clearing enemy mines for the amphibious landing onto that island. His ship had a wooden hull to avoid magnet magnetic mines that lay in wait. The ship was 168 feet long and drew a draft of only six feet of water. This small weight would help to avoid the detonation of contact mines which floated dangerously below the surface. The sailors also learned how to counteract a third type of mine known as an acoustic mine by transmitting special sonic waves. After overcoming his initial disappointment of being stationed aboard a minesweeper, my grandfather came to appreciate the small but important role he played in the Allied war effort. After victory at Okinawa, my grandfather's ship moved to its next assignment, Operation Olympic, the planned American invasion of the southern Japanese island of Kyushu. It was while his ship was performing its duties there, my grandfather, serving as the ship's radio operator, received a coded message that said to break off all operations and return to Okinawa. Little did he know that Japan had just surrendered and that the world had entered the atomic age. A few weeks later, a Japanese har harbor pilot was aboard my grandfather's ship, pointing out where the mines were hidden in Curry Harbor. My grandfather told me that it was sure easier finding enemy mines when you knew where they were. <laughs> An advantage of being aboard a minesweeper was that it was one of the first ships to enter the enemy's harbor, so you'd be one of the first to step onto foreign soil. In September 1945, my grandfather was asked to escort a senior officer to a town about 15 miles away called Hiroshima. My grandfather does not like to talk about what he saw that day, but he tells me that what he saw that day, he can never forget, no matter how hard he has tried for the past 70 years. My grandfather is my hero, whom I love very much. I imagine that if I had to predict what Molly would be doing when she's uh, in her 20s, she will be a reporter. Talk about precise detail about mines during World War II. And Molly will be part of a story circle, uh, those people who have um, written stories about World War II, if you wanted to ask her more questions about her story. Um, thank you, Molly. Great reporting. You know, I think it's Time for us to have a little artistic break. Um, we've heard from some authors, and now we're going to hear from uh, two artists um, and view a story from their perspective. Uh, before you're going to explore Bell Gage's illustration, uh, let me set the scene of the story. The story is called Even Baseball Isn't Safe. And the author is Paul Weir from Birmingham, Alabama who is unfortunately not with us today, but um, the illustration is, and so is the artist. This is 1945, it is near Berlin, Germany. I'm gonna read you just an excerpt from this story. One day in Germany, my grandfather Howard was playing baseball with his army buddies. He was relieved that World War II was over and that he could have just a little fun before he went home. Howard grabbed his bat and sauntered to home plate. But then something by home plate caught his eye. It looked shiny and was lying in the dirt. It's probably just scrap metal, Howard thought. He went over to get a closer look, then brushed his hand over the thing to remove the dirt covering it. Guess what he found? And here is Gwen Ashley, um, who you met earlier from St. Louis Public Schools. Gwen. I have a plan. 
pleasure of introducing Belle Sarah Gage and reviewing her illustration of Even Baseball Isn't Safe. Belle is a student at Wydown Middle School in the Clayton School District, Clayton, Missouri, and she completed her illustration in 2015. Sometimes illustrations are straightforward, but sometimes they create mystery, making us want to discover the story for ourselves. This is what Belle accomplished with her illustration. We know from the title that the story is about baseball, which might lead us to expect a story of a fun field day at a ballpark. However, Belle cleverly utilizes a key feature of the storyline to capture our attention. She effectively uses bold, dark lines that create shapes and details that define the most important object in the story, the landmine. The very thought of a landmine elicits fear of impending danger and captures our attention, which is certainly the goal of an illustrator. Of course, the hand and the landmine are the main focal points. However, Bell enhances the illustration's background with the use of shading and dots or marks. Bell is not, at this time, she's going to come and give us insight into her creative process for developing this illustration. Please help me welcome Bell Sage Gage. In my illustration for the story, Even Baseball Isn't Safe, I show a hand uncovering a mine. I was motivated to depict this scene in my illustration because the idea of finding a mine on an average baseball, baseball field seemed both terrifying and intriguing. I began my drawing by researching a little about mines and looking at pictures. I combined a few aspects of some different pictures to create my own mine. However, when I finished a first very light sketch, I placed my hand on the paper and traced it. Then I erased away the lines from the mine under the tracing. Finally, I darkened the lines and added details to the hand. Then I, um, my last step was adding a background, which was created through dotting and smudging the dots. I most enjoyed drawing the mine because it was the most interesting part of the picture to me, and it has a lot of fine details. However, it also wasn't too hard since it's symmetrical, and I pretty much just repeated the same steps. I am most fond of the background because I'm proud of what a unique technique I used. And now our next author is going to be Jethra Malapedi. Jethra was in the sixth grade at Crestview Middle School in the Rockwood School District, Ellisville, Missouri, when he wrote his story, The Pathway. The Pathway. Circa 1950, Lodilanka, Andhra Pradesh, India. This story goes back to my grandfather's childhood in Lodilanka a small hamlet near the southeastern coast of Andhra Pradesh, India. My grandfather was the youngest of eight children. His mother was illiterate, but his father could read and write. His family owned immense fertile farmland. The, cell, the elder siblings worked on the farm to help their father, while the younger three brothers were sent to school to acquire an education. Sometimes the younger brothers would also help out with some small chores too. The toughest struggle my grandfather went through was not at school itself, but getting there. He would walk with his brothers for a total of six and a half miles in the morning and six and a half miles back in the evening, the reason being that his village was way too small to have a school. He walked mostly through rice paddy fields. There was no paved road back then and only small pathways, but his struggles did not end there. On his way to school, there was an irrigation canal coming directly from the river Krishna. He had to cross this canal to get to the school. 
It was usually very shallow, but during the monsoons, the canal would become surprisingly deep. In order to cross it and remain dry, my grandfather and my great uncles would take off their clothes and place them with their books on top of their heads and walk across the canal with the cold river water up to their necks. In these conditions, my grandfather almost drowned once, but to his luck, one of his uncles was working in a field nearby and saved him. Despite his struggles, my grandfather also had a lot of fun on his way to school. Due to flooding after harsh storms, the fish from the river would get stuck in nets in small creeks. They would jump about, rippling the water. My grandfather desired to take them home, but he didn't have any small baskets to contain them. So he would ma make a basket from leaves of nearby palm trees and then carry them home. His mother would then cook fish curry for the entire family. My grandfather is now 65 and is retired after successfully complete, completing a career in, as a mechanical engineer. He still remembers his childhood days with pleasure. Though I have never been to Lota de Lanka, I imagine it is as beautiful as it was when my grandfather roamed its vast green fields. Details just vivid. I I will carry away from that story the vision of the boys with the clothes on their head um, and their books walking through the irrigation canal with the, the water up to here or making uh, the basket for the fish out of palm leaves. Um, you know that's the mark of a of, of a real author, isn't it? To to create details such that we. Um, who get to listen or read the stories can picture them long after the story is over. So thank you, Jethra. And our next author is Molly Kuzma from the O'Neill School in Southern Pines, North Carolina. And she wrote this story when she was in the seventh grade. And this is the world's most expensive toaster. How about that for a title? <laughs> Molly. <laughs> World's Most Expensive Toaster, 1958, Pennsylvania. Just last month, I was driving with my grandparents during a brief trip to Pennsylvania. Despite the cost of gasoline having recently dropped, it seemed that my grandfather grumbled every time we passed a certain Exxon gas station by his, near their home in Pennsylvania. When I observed this behavior on repeated occasions, I asked him why he acted this way. He replied, why don't you ask your grandmother about the world's costliest toaster? I was confused. My grandmother met my grandfather in 1950. She was a 21-year-old girl from northern Pennsylvania. My grandfather was a 23-year-old United States Navy veteran who had served three years in the Pacific during World War II. Using his GI Bill, he completed his college degree in textile engineering. After graduating, he landed a job and at a chemical firm in Pennsylvania. He was now ready to pop the question to my grandmother. This meant that she too would have to move to Philadelphia. However, before this could become a reality, my grandmother would also need to find a job. My grandfather's salary was too meager to support the newlywed couple. Fortunately, my grandfather's sister was able to land my grandmother a job at a, as a billing clerk at a regional office for the Standard Oil Company of New Jersey. Standard Oil of New Jersey, also known as ESSO, was one of the companies formed from the breakup of the Standard Oil Monopoly founded by John D. Rockefeller. My grandparents were married February 16, 1952, and my grandmother started her new job that following Monday, February 18th. My grandmother worked at Esso for six years until becoming pregnant with my oldest uncle. Back then, once a woman began to show, it was expected for her to resign since it was thought to be inappropriate to continue work in this condition. As part of her salary, the company established a profit sharing plan. When it came time to leave, my grandmother had the choice of either rolling one third of the accrued value into this, of the savings plan into Esso's stock or cash out for approximately $1,000. In addition, there was an extra incentive of a brand new Sunbeam T20B toaster for cashing out. The latter offer proved irresistible for the young couple still living in a two-room apartment with their first child on the way. With the extra
extra money, my grandparents bought some U.S. saving bonds, new rugs, and a new set of kitchenware to go along with that marvelous new toaster. In 1973, Esso became Exxon, and in 1999, it merged to form ExxonMobil. Although no one can predict the future, if my grandmother kept the approximate $1,000 of Esso's stock back in 1956, it is estimated that that value of that stock today would be worth over $137,000. On the other hand, she did keep the toaster for 15 years. So if you're ever looking for sound financial advice, don't ask my grandparents. <laughs> just wonder where that was going with a, with a title like the world's most expensive poster. You know, and Molly, uh, those of us who have some years on us here in the audience are maybe thinking about uh, decisions that we made that might be comparable. Anyway, thanks so much, Molly, for traveling all the way from um, Southern Pines to be with us today. Um, our next author is Anagi Rhoda Shaloni Pires. And Anagi was in the fifth grade at Kirk Day School in St. Louis, Missouri, when she wrote her story, also an intriguing title, 50 years ago and 100 years later. Anagi.
just an utterly unique story. Do you, do you believe those costumes and, and what uh, the, the matriarch of the family created? And how about the, the details? Um, a white-haired, white-bearded, barefooted, spectacled old man in a tattered sarong leaning on his staff. That was Cuckoo Mama, who was six years old. Is that right? Six or eight? Was it Anagi? Six? Yeah, six. Anagi's father um, was a teapot. And unfortunately, he is not able to be with us today, but, but he is working. So we are thinking of you wherever you are. Thank you, Anagi. And our next uh, author, who you've seen before as the illustrator, um, is Belle Sarah Gage. And Belle was in the seventh grade at Wydown Middle School in the Clayton School District, Clayton, Missouri, when she wrote Sandman. Come on down. near Salmon, Idaho, USA. It was a beautiful summer day in Idaho, and I was rafting down the Salmon River with my family and friends, the perfect way to spend my summer vacation. In fact, if I could go back in time, there isn't a single thing I would change about that day. Well, actually, come to think of it, I would cut out the part where I almost died. <laughs> we had taken a break from rafting, the adults were making sandwiches for lunch, and us kids were splashing around in the water until that got boring. We needed a challenge. My brother suggested we dig a huge tunnel into the side of the river bank. The other kids approved, and we all began digging. The sand wedged under our fingernails and scraped our arms, but we didn't mind. The prospect of digging a gigantic hole was enough to overcome pain. As time passed, the tunnel grew until it went so deep into the bank that we had to crawl in to dig deeper. Since I was the smallest kid, it was natural that I was chosen to crawl in, since it was easiest for me to wiggle out. In and out I went, transporting handfuls of sand. The further I dug, the darker it got, until I was blindly thrashing about. For kids looking for a challenge, the obvious solution to this problem is not to stop digging, but instead to dig another hole down from the surface to let in sunlight. So we took a break from digging our original hole and started digging the window. Once the window reached the tunnel, I went back to wiggling in and out. Unfortunately, the window made the tunnel unstable and crash, it collapsed. I desperately tried to push up, but to no avail. The sand on top of me was so heavy, there was no way I could get out. I was buried alive. The sand burned my eyes and clogged my nose and ears. There was a tiny air pocket since my hands were below me in a plank position, but every time I inhaled, my lungs got a fresh coat of sand, tickling my throat and making the next breath more difficult. I thought if I could lower myself a tiny bit, I could get enough momentum to push out. But when I did, the sand crushed me even more. There was no room. I was running out of air. I'm going to suffocate. I'm going to die. After what seemed like hours, my friends dug me up. I used my last ounce of strength to climb out of the hole, and I was rather disappointed with my welcome. The clueless adults were still making sandwiches. As for my friends, they didn't even seem relieved to see me. In fact, they were laughing at me, chanting, Sandman, Sandman. Angry, I plugged my sand-clogged ears. To this day, my brother still calls me the Sandman. This is my dad's story, which nearly cost him his life, and mine. Thank you. How about that? Does Belle not have a knack for making a seriously scary story seriously funny? I mean, it's amazing, Belle. Uh, we are very grateful that her dad was dug up, otherwise, of course, Belle wouldn't be here, uh, Amy wouldn't be married, no. Uh, I noticed that, that Brian is not here today. Okay, he is the source of, of, of many stories, I've noticed. We thank him. And now here to uh, introduce um, an artist uh, of the story, Cold Blooded Savior, will be Gwen Ashley. But let me just set the scene for you. This is the story. How about that for a title? 
cold-blooded savior. The author is Sophia Brantley from Kinston, North Carolina. And the story takes place in 1977 in Goldsboro, North Carolina. It's basically about a young man um, who is in his backyard and just happens to catch a um, sort of a rat snake. And uh, he decides to go get a donut, gets on his bike, goes for a ride, it's a beautiful spring day, drapes the snake around his neck. And this is an excerpt from the story. As I went under the bridge on my bike and out the other side, I saw movement in the trees to my right. I looked a little closer and saw a gang of five teenage boys up to no good. One of the boys noticed me and pointed at me with menacing eyes. The whole gang turned and started aggressively marching toward me, blocking my path. I brought my bike to a sudden halt, my hands quivering as I tightly gripped the handlebars. Gwen? <coughs> I am pleased to introduce Rachel Benitez Borrego and to review her illustration of Cold Blooded Savior. Rachel is a fourth grade student at Perrymount Elementary School in the Parkway School District in Baldwin, Missouri. Rachel also participated in the art classes at Art Unleash, an art studio in Chesterfield, Missouri. Rachel has created a complete visual composition illustrating a scene from the story. This scene is a pivotal point in the story. From an anticipated, carefree weekend bike ride to this frightening confrontation. The illustration communicates emotions emotions of aggression, surprise, fear, anxiety, and apprehension. She illustrates these emotions with various facial expressions and body language and symbols that suggest words and sounds. She accomplishes this by using various principles and elements of art. The variety of shapes and forms are created by her creative use of lines. The implied texture is effectively accomplished by the use of a variety of different lines. We can certainly appreciate her attention to detail. Rachel helps us not only see the picture, but to feel the emotions and imagine the sounds. At this time, Rachel will give us insight into her process for creating this illustration. Please welcome Rachel. Well, to start with, I really like art and it's my favorite subject. Also, I've been taking art classes since I was four, and my first art teacher was named Miss K. The reason that I chose to draw Cold Blooded Savior was because it had an interesting title and an even more interesting story. Besides, I've always liked heroes, and the snake was a hero, even though it was a very unlikely hero. It was really fun drawing it, especially the gang of boys, because of all the crazy stuff. For example, the leader is the forest boy, and he's wearing a shirt that says, tough. Also, the third boy has a shirt with, a shirt with lightning bolts and hair with stripes because it's actually blonde hair. The fourth boy has old pants and a shirt that says, keep away. Thank you. So just so you know how the story ends, once the gang members see the snake around the boy's neck, they think it's a boa constrictor, and they take off. They scatter in all directions, even though it was just sort of a pet rat snake that he had found in the backyard. So, our hero is vanquished. Okay, thank you, Rachel and Gwen Ashley.
Our next author is Timothy Lai, and Timothy was in the sixth grade at Twin Oaks Christian School in Baldwin, Missouri, when he wrote the story, A Failed Attempt to Escape Vietnam. A Failed Attempt to Escape Vietnam, 1982, Ho Chi Minh City. After the Vietnam War ended in 1975, my dad's family suffered hardship as other Vietnamese families did. My grandpa was put in a political prison camp for five years because he had worked with the old government. He was released in 1980 but faced unemployment to find a, be to find a better future for his family. My grandpa took my dad and uncle on a journey to escape Vietnam by boat when my father was 10 years old. Even though it seemed a failure at the time, it was a blessing from God. On June 1st, 1982, my grandpa and uncle warily walked to a big fishing boat, pretending to be a fisherman working for the boat owner. My dad took a bus ride to pick up location in Ho Chi Minh City. For five hours, he waited with 17 others at a tiny house located next to a canal with pitch black water and an unforgettable smell of raw sewage. At 10 o'clock p.m., a small fishing boat arrived. My dad and others climbed into the boat and sat in the brace position. They were covered in fishing nets, bananas, and tarps to avoid detection by the police. They rode two hours in heat and humidity, always fearing authorities who might find them. Then my dad reunited with my grandpa and uncle on a bigger fishing boat. The mother boat was limited to 80 people, but became overloaded with 100 people trying to escape Vietnam. Two hours into the journey, the boat's engine stopped working. Water had leaked into the engine room, causing the engine to shut down. My grandpa helped other men to fix the engine while they attempted to continue moving. After two hours, the boat was finally fixed, and the journey continued around 5 o'clock a.m. The boat encountered the Coast Guard patrol. The captain tried to avoid it, but surrendered after a 30-minute chase when the Coast Guard started shooting and throwing grenades at the boat. Consequently, my grandpa and uncle and dad were jailed in prison camp for people trying to escape the country. My dad and uncle stayed in an area for women and children, while my grandpa resided in a separate jail cell. Even though my dad was shocked and scared, he remained tough to take care of my uncle. After 21 days, my, my dad and uncle were released, and my grandpa was transferred to a different jail, and then released after two years. Even though he escaped bail, it was a blessing from God. According to my grandparents, if the boat had not been stopped, everyone would have perished at sea due to the overload and the water leaking problem. In April 1991, my dad's family came to America by a special program called the Humanitarian Operation, which was approved by the United States government. Even though it was a long wait and my dad's family had been through a lot, my dad says it was worth it. He believed that it was God's plan and he thanked God for it. What a moving story, Timothy. And your dad is here, is that right? Would you, would you like to stand? We would like to recognize you. What a moving story and what a perspective from which to view uh, suffering and hardship. Thank you for telling that story, Timothy. Um, our last author is Bray Woodard. And Bray is here from Southern Pines, North Carolina, as well as Molly was, from the O'Neill School, where she was in the eighth grade this past year. And when she wrote the story, Eyes Straight Ahead. Bray? Eyes Straight Ahead, 1985, Troy, North Carolina. Left with the light. 
cautiously, Belinda turned on to North Main. It was one o'clock, and traffic in Troy was light. Mr. Green sat on the passenger side with the clipboard. It was Belinda's third driver's education lesson. She was a high school sophomore at West Montgomery and had always worn dresses. Her mother never owned pants and had never driven a car. Right, use your signal. Belinda's hands were at 10 and 2, eyes stared directly ahead, and never looking at the rear or side view mirrors. She only looked straight ahead. She wanted so much to pass this course. Right on, Russell, and keep straight, Mr. Green spoke. They had circled the city block and were back at Route 27. The high school was on Highway 109, four miles ahead. Belinda drove between 38 miles an hour and 41 miles an hour. All was quiet in the car. Shortly, the turn to the school arrived. Belinda wanted to make the turn to the school, but Mr. Green said nothing. Therefore, Belinda kept driving straight past the school. Before long, Belinda crossed into the next county. She had been to Albemarle about six times. She would go to Sky City to purchase bolts of cloth. Belinda kept driving through Albemarle, then to the next town. Belinda drove straight, hands at 10 and 2, eyes straight ahead. Mr. Green was quiet, so on they drove. The, the Montgomery County school buses left her school at 3.15 p.m. Belinda dared to take her eyes off the road and check her wristwatch, 2.15 p.m. in red. She would miss her bus. Belinda pulled the car off the road, already two counties from her school. Belinda turned the car around. Mr. Green was quiet. This time, Belinda went a little faster than the speed limit, but still, Mr. Green was quiet. Belinda must thought she was doing a great job. When they pulled into the school parking lot, kids were loading the buses. Belinda parked the car and ran to the bus, the car's motor still running. Sally Thompson was a senior and drove to school. Belinda had parked the driver's education car beside Sally's. The slump Mr. Green on the passenger side of the car caught Sally's attention. Hey, Mr. Green. Mr. Green didn't move. Sally yelled to the assistant principal. When the assistant principal Jones reached the driver's education car, Mr. Green could not be awakened. Mr. Mr. Jones noticed the medical bracelet on Mr. Green's wrist that said, diabetic. Now, diabetic comas aren't usually punchlines and jokes. Don't worry. Mr. Green slept in his own bed that night. What does make good jokes are two and a half hour driver's education session across North Carolina. The West Montgomery principal told Belinda what happened the next day. Belinda eventually learned how to drive correctly. She learned to make sure her passengers were happy and conscious. <laughs> Well, what an amazing uh, group of authors and stories uh, from expensive toasters to uh, driver's ed teachers in diabetic coma to a girl spending the night at her grandma's like five steps down the hallway. I mean, do you even believe these stories? We have to clap for everyone. It's amazing. the illustrations that were so vividly portrayed uh, the details of the story as well. It has come to my attention that Zachary Fink's grandmother, um, who was a little girl when the telegram came to their house in the World War II time, is here. Is that right? Are you here? whose story was written about, who were part of, because we'd like to recognize you. Okay. Well, then I'm going to turn the microphone back to Connie. You know, through the last 11 years, I have read thousands and thousands and thousands of family stories, and every one of them just touches me in its own way. I, I can't believe, like you talked about, Martha, the, the variety of emotions that came up during this past hour as we were hearing these stories. So 
that stories are so personal. So what we want to do when we leave this room in just a few minutes is we're inviting you to come with us to, there are two classrooms just down the hall, and we're going to uh, ask you to gather with us in small groups and have the opportunity to explore these personal stories on a personal level. And you'll have the opportunity to talk with the authors and the illustrators and the family members if they're there at the circle at the time you're there. And let, uh, we can just all recognize and enjoy the fact that these stories are very personal and yet they're also so universal. They touch us in a way that reminds us of what it means to be human. And so this will be an opportunity for you to uh, ask those questions that you might have, uh, that might have occurred to you while you were listening to the story, or give a compliment to the young uh, author or artist, or just have a conversation about what the story you heard meant, meant to you. And that will mean a lot to the young people as well. Um, I want to explain a little bit about how that's going to work. And um, Let's see, what's the easiest way to say this? If you, go to, if you go right out the door and down the hall, to the left, oh I know, over by the registration table, there is a classroom that has a glass wall. That's where all the authors and artists of the World War II stories are going to gather. And they will be at a table there so that if you have a uh, copy of Echoes from World War II that you want those authors and artists to sign, remember you can get those from the gift shop upstairs, and um, they'll be ready to sign copies for you as the author or artist of uh, their contribution to that book. And also the other World War, sto stories, World War II stories that were published this year in Randy Andy Volume 11, those authors and artists will be in that room as well. Um, as you know, the uh, Randy Andy Volume 11 was published as an e-book, so we won't be signing those books today. And if you uh, have any question about how to get a copy of, of the Grand Annie Volume 11, please ask one of us or ask uh, a family member of the authors and artists because they have copies that they can forward to you. Our goal is for these stories to be shared as much as possible. In the second classroom, which is straight down the hall, there is a, uh, that's a larger classroom, and we have four story circles set up in that room. One of them is marked... Um, what did we mark it? Granny Annie Extension Activities or something like that. Extending the Granny Annie, I think is what it says. And that uh, circle is where we're inviting parents and teachers to gather together and share ideas of how to extend the Granny Annie experience in other ways in the classroom beyond the writing, interviewing, writing, revising, illustrating uh, aspect. Uh, so many te teachers through the year have done so much more with the project. They've made quilts, they've made, made classroom books, they've uh, read their stories over the intercom. Uh, lots, of, lots of ideas of how, how to share those stories in more ways. So that's one circle you might want to visit. The other three circles in the larger classroom are marked with the year dates of the stories. So if there was a story you particularly wanted to follow up on, just look at what year that story took place, and then you can go to that, to that um, story circle. Does that make sense? Does anyone have any questions about that? Okay, we're going to let the authors and artists exit first, and you can go right now, authors and artists, because we want to get your picture taken as a, a large group. And I want to say to the family members, if you, if you have not had a family picture taken yet, you're welcome to do that today. Just go to the family, uh, to the quilt, the area with the quilt and the rocking chair, and, and we'd love to take a, a picture of your family today. All the photos that we take here today will be posted on the Facebook page, Granny Annie's Facebook page. It'll take us a few days to get them all up, but they will be there in the next week or two. And also, um, the recording, the video recording of today's program will be posted on YouTube. So you can watch for that. We'll announce it on our, the Granny Annie's website when those are available. Um, anything else? Then I invite you to relax for just a few minutes, if you would. Enjoy uh, seeing this, again, this list of the students who submitted stories this year and uh, also their story titles. 
we were just so delighted to read every one of those stories and um, I wish we could have published all of them and, and I wish you could have read all of them because they were a delight. So enjoy those and when you're ready, uh, in a few minutes, join us in the classrooms and be sure to stop and say hello to Fran and me and, and Brad and, and Linda and, and all the volunteers who are here today and let us know what this has meant to you and your family. We're always happy to hear how your sharing your story has been meaningful for you. Thank you all so much.